Good morning, everyone. I am Jessie Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocates. It's great to see all of you today uh, for one of my favorite forums of the year as we talk about um, upcoming Kids Count data and hear from two Frankfurt leaders. As I was putting my son in the car today, he saw the pin on my scarf and he was like, why are you wearing that? And I told him what I was doing and he was unimpressed. And he said, so it's like a celebration of Kentucky. And I was like, yeah, kind of, it is. So this is a celebration of Kentucky and tech, Kentucky kids, but also a real hard look at um, kind of how far we need to go, especially for some of our kids. So just a reminder that we're recording today's forum as both a video and a podcast. So we ask that you stay muted, but please do drop your questions into the chat if we aren't able to address them in the chat, we will address them in follow-up. I know folks may have some specific data questions and stuff. So with that, I am gonna turn it over to Terry Brooks. Well, gobble, gobble. Uh, great that you're joining us. Uh, so many of you have been on so many of these. Uh, I believe this is our 70th forum. Uh, and you know we have talked to leaders from uh, Washington in our federal delegation. Uh, folks within the administration, folks in the General Assembly, local voices. So uh, we always uh, look forward to this. Uh, today is a, a really important discussion. Uh, you will remember that, that last week uh, we, uh, we began to talk about uh, kids count and uh, particularly around uh, the concepts of racial disparities. Uh, we had Senator Neal and Representative Tammany on and uh, we had a, a a great discussion. Uh, this is part two and uh, is going to be a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to try, I don't know if I can do this on the screen, but uh, so here is the metaphor today, okay? You see that shovel? Because uh, today is a dig. Uh, I don't have to tell you that it is very easy for elected leaders to engage in rhetoric, headline rhetoric. Uh, what I am so uh, appreciative of is that our two elected leaders today, uh, who will get introduced in just a second, uh, they are building a reputation for digging before speaking, digging into data, digging into national trends, and, and that is absolutely vital. Uh, you know, when, when we look at the macro view of Kids Count this year, there's some big takeaways. Uh, it may be the, uh, the bimodal distribution when it comes to economic well-being, that overall trend that paints a good picture, and the uh, disturbing trend that indicates that our most rural kids and our most urban kids uh, are so much more likely to be suffering from poverty. Or the section on uh, child welfare, which reflects uh, real problems uh, around uh, kids in foster care, uh, reunification efforts across the state. Or, or maybe it's looking at trend lines that are beginning to bubble up, like out of school suspensions. I mean, there's so much data in kids count, everybody, uh, we encourage, in fact, everybody to, to, to look at that and find those couple data points that animate your brain and your heart. But the power of Kids Count is that our priorities and solutions are shaped by data, not just by opinion. And that's really going to be the focus today. Uh, we do want to give you a, a little bit of a preview, uh, that preview being that uh, on December 8th, uh, we're having House and Senate leadership uh, come to the table, and they're going to be given a, uh, a landscape of the 2022 session as, as they see it. So uh, that is a, an event we hope you will join. We also always want to shout out to partners who made possible in terms of the forum and kids count. Uh, today, we want to especially thank uh, Passport Health, Cozair Charities, and as always, Aetna Better Health for these forums. So we're going to move right into the topic. I had planned a rather uh, elaborate uh, introduction. 
Uh, but spoiler alert, uh, Jesse and some comments already gave it away. So we were going to do a little bit of a big time announcement because commitment is defined as when we said to Mahak, Mahak, what do you hope to do for your birthday? Her answer was, I would love to moderate a forum with representatives Cole Carney and Heverin on data implications for kids count. Now that, that is rare commitment. So Mahak, happy birthday. And could you please come up with a more creative way to spend your birthday? I, I do okay. believe there's I do believe there's a ball game on tonight that you're interested in. So that's yeah. that's a good thing. So Mahak, on behalf of everybody, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Take Thank it away. Thank you. Um, well, that's quite the introduction. Yes, this is exactly how I wanted to spend my birthday. So thank you, Terry, and thank you, representatives, for joining so we could have this conversation. So today we're going to talk about the 2021 Kentucky Kids Count data book that examines um, data really um, by race and ethnicity. It talks about the impacts of systematic racism that impact children and families, and then also solutions to advance race equity so every child could thrive. Um, this is our 31st edition of this publication, which also features the 17 measures of child well-being, um, which shows outcomes for children across the Commonwealth that have improved, worsened, or stayed worse, uh, or stayed um, the same over the last five-year period. And while the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many families in many ways that do not show up in the data yet, the book um, identifies pre-existing challenges and areas of much needed improvement. Also, I wanted to share a couple new indicators um, are also featured in this year's book in the education spread, as well as the economic security section. Um, and then you'll read, as you flip through the book, um, you'll notice a reoccurring focus on experiences of Black and Latinx youth, um, and that's really due to the part of the fact that their challenges and treatment has been more documented and researched than other racial and ethnic groups. However, other communities of color, as well as immigrant and refugee families of all backgrounds, have they have their own experiences and challenges. Sometimes they're similar, sometimes they're unique, but they're equally important for us to acknowledge and address. And now I'm going to get a little wonky for a second, but I want um, to share this data note because I know our data team would want me to uh, elevate this point. You'll notice that data is included for specific racial and ethnical uh, ethnic groups whenever it's available and possible and reliable. Um, there are some limitations that exist in data available due to factors um, such as survey data not being reliable for small population groups, um, people not disclosing demographic information due to distrust in how it might be used, or just the fact that limited racial um, ethnic categories for people who choose um, how they choose um, from. So I just wanted to make that clarification before we dive into the data um, that my colleagues are going to share. Also, you'll notice in this year's opening essay also features a call to action for both advocates, but also state and local policymakers to work together to advance race equity um, for Kentucky kids. And moving forward, um, this year we also are bringing back a popular feature, I would say, is um, really children population by race for each county. Um, this data is based on um, the 2020 census, and we hope that it serves as a reminder to advocates and policymakers that kids of color are counting on them. And so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues to share some quick data snapshots um, within each domain of the book and highlighted solutions. So, Corinna. Thank you, Mac. Um, today, I'm going to be spending a couple of minutes just diving into that economic security data, including our new indicator, which is children living in households with a high rental cost burden. Um, this indicator is replacing our indicator for children living in deep poverty. However, you can still find the deep poverty website or indicator at our data center on kyyouth.org. Um, so it's important to frame the conversation around economic security by saying that many Kentucky children and families live in communities that have suffered from lack of investment and subsequently offer few stable job opportunities. For communities of color, this lack of opportunity has resulted in significant differences in income by race. 
In addition to gaps in earnings, historic and ongoing discriminatory lending and housing practices have prevented members of the Black community from building wealth through home equity or business assets. This wealth gap has multiplied across generations and cont contributes to the persistent high rate of Black families living in poverty and earning incomes too low to meet even basic family needs. Um, so in order to afford basic family needs, which is housing, food, transportation, other necessities, most Kentucky families need to earn an income of about 200% of the federal poverty line. In Kentucky, 45% of all children live below this line. For Kentucky's Black and Latinx children, this number is significantly higher. 69% of Black children and 58% of Latinx children live below 200% of the federal poverty line. Families living below this line often struggle to afford basic needs, putting them at risk of food insecurity and housing insecurity. 17.9% um, of Kentucky kids live in a food insecure household, while 45% of Kentucky kids live in a household with a higher rental cost burden. Um, housing insecurity is something that was massively exacerbated by the pandemic and, like many of our indicators, affected communities of color to a far greater degree. During the first year of the pandemic, 40% of Black families and 30% of Latinx families were at risk of not being able to pay for housing, compared to 18% of white families. Um, these numbers are from the first year of the pandemic, but we know the economic impact of COVID-19 will likely last far longer than the pandemic itself. To ensure children have a safe, stable place to call home, many families will continue to need assistance paying for their rent, mortgage, and utilities. Um, additionally, policies like right to counsel can help stop unjust evictions, settle disputes between landlords and tenants, and keep families in their home. Moving beyond the scope of housing, Kentucky offers a number of programs designed to promote economic security for families. Programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program for Women, Infant, and Children, and the Kentucky Transitional Assistance Program, or SNAP, WIC, and KTAP form a safety net to catch families when they fall on hard times and help them meet their basic needs. Policymakers should prioritize maintaining funding for them. Additionally, Congress has a really exciting opportunity right now to create a new safety net for parents and families by permanently authorizing and expanding the child tax credit. And with that, I will turn it over to Patricia Tennant to talk about education. Thanks, Karina. So for the education section this year, um, we pulled out a few highlights. Um, and one uh, thing I'd like to mention, first of all, I think Mahek mentioned we have some new indicators um, that from our usual spread. Um, and the reason for this is due to the pandemic and many students missing state testing, comprehensive data is unavailable for the most recent school year for kindergarten readiness fourth grade reading and eighth grade math scores, which we know are really critical key measures for kids um, that we normally include in our 17 um, key indicators we feature in our data dashboard. But uh, for these reasons, uh, we chose to replace these education data, data points this year with the proportion of public school students experiencing homelessness, um, students with an IEP due to a disability, and an out of school suspension rates. Um, in addition to our normal one, which was um, high school graduation. Um, and um, we know that a high school diploma is essential to achieving economic self-sufficiency. Um, high school graduates earn more than those without diploma. Diplomas contribute more in taxes and use public assistance less often. In turn, failure to graduate is associated with a lifetime of lower wages, poor health and higher rates of incarceration. So the good news is that nine out of 10 high schoolers graduated on time in the most recent school year, um, but we can't stop there. So because we know that rates of graduating on time are lower for more uh, most youth of color. Um, in addition, high schools have prepared only about one in four black and Latinx students to succeed in college and careers. And you can see this portrayed in, in the graph that's in the slides now. So we see, you can see there that the rates of graduating on time are lower for most youth of color um, at 83.9%, 83.5% for black and Latinx students. Um, in addition, high schools have prepared only about one in four 
Black and Latinx students to succeed in college or careers, which you can see in this graphic, it shows um, the purple, the 23% and 26% relatively um, compared to, um, you know, 46% of all students. Compounding this, the high cost of college and difficulty navigating financial aid and college enrollment on top of leaving high school underprepared uh, partially explains why, as a result, we see Black and Latinx youth are less likely to attend and stay in college. And you can read more about that in detail um, in the book. Um, some policy solutions that we identified that are related to this college and career readiness specifically are to one is to require districts to assess individual student family needs for success. Um, this should happen in partnership with students and families, which we could use the IEP process as a model. Um, this tailored approach can improve student progress in meeting college and career readiness standards. In addition, while we want to make sure all youth in Kentucky are completing the FAFSA. Um, we need to make sure that we um, assist youth of color intentionally in securing that financial support for college um, by helping them complete the FAFSA, secure college scholarships, and assess financial aid packages, um, as well as helping students seeking citizenship and justice involved youth navigate this process, which um, it can be confusing, but is incredibly important. Um, the next data point that I'd like to lift up for you all are out of school suspensions. Um, and there's a lot going on in this graphic here, so I'll try to talk you through it. Um, just and some important framing to begin with, while no evidence shows that out of school suspensions work to improve student behavior, schools continue to use them at an increasing rate um, with 9.6 suspensions for every 100 students enrolled. Um, and this is before the, this is pre pandemic before the pandemic necessitated remote learning. Um, digging deeper into that, we see that black students are suspended more often as early as kindergarten. Um, and research suggests that unconscious bias and lack of cultural understanding contributes to schools acting differently towards youth of color, um, from teacher expectations of students to the frequency and severity of discipline used, and that's beginning as early as preschool. Um, you can see clearly here in this graphic that disparities grow during middle school and high school. So, for example, in middle school, black students experience out of school suspensions at a rate of 47.8 per 100 students compared to a rate of 10.9 for white students. Um, and we think we know that those out of school suspensions don't work, but they're also harmful um, to the students' outcomes. So, um, some policy solutions that we lift up in the book that are related to this are to one, to utilize alternative responses to student behavior that do not exclude children from the classroom. This could be mental health supports, um, restorative justice practices. And this would could would reduce the disproportionate impact on black student learning and keep youth connected to school. Um, we also uh, want to lift up that we need to be intentionally connecting with parents and caregivers throughout the school year. And this is uh, connecting with them about their students work uh, throughout the year, rather than just when a problem arises. Um, this builds strong school family relationships and expands student support networks. Uh, when schools increase family engagement in their students' learning, um, we know that academic achievement improves. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Alicia Watley, to talk to you about the health section. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, so I'm going to dive a little bit into what's going on um, on our health indicators, and I'll start with um, some good news, just that we know the percentage of children under the age of 19 in Kentucky um, who are insured remains pretty high. It's over 95 percent. Um, and 100 out of our 120 counties have actually improved that rate of children having health coverage. Um, but along with that, we do want to point out that there is a disparity among Latinx children with only 91% being insured. Um, and that's compared to 97% of Black children and 96% of white children. Um, so in addition to that, we know that parents' health and access to health insurance coverage, um, especially for mothers, affects the health and well-being of their children. 
Um, postpartum is a very vulnerable time for new mothers and their babies. And it is, this is especially true for women on Medicaid. Um, and many of whom are at risk of losing their health coverage just 60 days after the end of their pregnancy. Um, so despite the increased risk of postpartum death and illness, up to half of women do not receive that routine care that they need after giving birth. Um, and this is regardless of whether or not they experience any complications during their pregnancy. Um, we know that barriers like lack of parental health insurance um, and maybe not hearing about what programs are available to them um, and social and economic factors keep some families from connecting to the supports that are available. Um, also, there are environmental factors such as secondhand smoke in inhalation and heat exposure, um, as well as age and maternal health, and those can all contribute to birth outcomes as well. Um, but the everyday stress of persistent racism is really one big cause of worse birth outcomes for Black mothers um, in Kentucky. And consequently, Black mothers experience the highest rates of low weight births. Um, and they're much more likely to die within the first year after giving birth. Um, and that's at a rate of 42.1 per 100,000 live births. And that's as compared to only 17.2 per 100,000 live births for white mothers. Um, so with those being highlighted, I really just want to talk a little bit about the solutions that we know um, could resolve some of these issues. And the first one being we really need to continue to see investments in the Medicaid and KCHIP programs. Um, and specifically doing some outreach and enrollment efforts with the Latinx population um, using culturally relevant messaging and trusted messengers to close that coverage gap among Latinx youth. Um, additionally, we want to see um, an extension of Medicaid coverage of up to 12 months for postpartum mothers um, to make sure that they're able to receive all the care that they need after delivering and during the first year of their child's life. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to lift up just strengthening um, access to quality health care before, during, and after pregnancy, and closing gaps in use of programs like the HANDS Home Visiting Program, um, as this would reduce disparities in the critical birth outcomes for Black mothers and their babies. And with that, I will pass it to uh, my colleague Courtney Downs to talk a little bit more about our family and community indicators. All right, thank you, Alicia. So I am going to start by talking a little bit about juvenile justice and then I'll get into the child welfare data. Um, so we can continue building a more effective juvenile justice system by using age appropriate responses to offenses and also applying those responses equitably. So even though data shows um, modest differences in behaviors across age or across groups, Black youth still receive disparate treatment at every step of the system. So when we look at the rates of young people who are incarcerated, the numbers continue to fall, which is a good thing. Um, however, Black youth continue to be overrepresented at a rate of 13.4 per 1,000 youth uh, between the ages of 10 and 17, as compared to 4.8 for Latinx and 2.7 for white youth. Um, and we know that, um, at least in part, the pandemic had a considerable impact on the number of young people who were released from detention in 2020, um, and that that was factored into certain judicial decisions to use alternatives to detention without compromising public safety later. Um, so continuing to use those practices can help keep young people out of detention for offenses that do not pose a threat to public safety. So then when we talk about um, or when we think about some solutions that we want to consider, um, the first one is strengthening and expanding young people's access to community based services and using them as alternatives to detention. And when I say access, I mean understanding and, and working around the barriers and challenges that families may face that make it more difficult for them to access those resources. So not every parent works a traditional nine to five job or um, or a job where they can take time off of work whenever they need to. Not all families have reliable transportation. So again, understanding and working um, with families instead of penalizing kids for things that may be largely out of their control. Uh, the second thing is making sure that we are including communities that have been most impacted by juvenile incarceration in any of the conversations that we're having about how to remedy that. And then finally, creating and using age appropriate responses to children's behaviors, especially in schools. Um, like Patricia had talked about earlier, a large number of the complaints against young people come from the schools and black youth are disproportionately impacted. So implementing more prevention focused approaches within the schools like restorative justice and then 
also increasing partnerships with local organizations can help to reduce those disparities and then large numbers of young people who are entering the juvenile justice system. So moving on now to child welfare and kind of circling back to that first data point. Um, when we look at the child welfare system, communities can play a critical role in supporting parents and other caregivers whether it's helping them to manage stressful situations or providing support to meet their basic needs to prevent child abuse and neglect. Preventative actions can also keep the foster care population from continuing to swell. So when we look at the rate of children who are in foster care, it has gone up significantly from 39.2 per 1,000 children in 2013 to 2015 to now 53.7 per 1,000 children from 2018 to 2020. And then when we look at removals from the home, the rate of black youth, which is 21.6 per 1,000 children, um, is higher than the rate for white youth, which is 16.8, and then Latinx youth, which is 11.4. Black families face complex factors that make it more likely to have children removed from the home. So things like having that limited action, uh, limited access to prevention resources that I just talked about, um, a lack of programs that are specifically for families of color, implicit bias of staff, um, and then also policies that may have unintended consequences for some racial groups. So as we think about solutions that we wanna consider, the first thing is creating um, and or offering funding um, the expansion of primary prevention programs and resources and supportive services and making sure that those again are readily available within people's communities so these types of supports can address the family's basic needs like housing bills food um, as well as some of the more common and then um, complex risk factors for abuse and neglect like a, like addiction um, untreated mental health issues and then also family violence and we need to engage families and youth, especially families, or especially those of color, again, who are directly impacted by the child welfare system to ensure that prevention approaches um, reflect the community's needs and then also the culture. And finally, we wanna prioritize relative placement. So if a kid cannot stay um, safely at home with their parents, making sure that they're still living with a relative and then also finding ways to provide support for kinship caregivers. And I think I'm going to turn it back over to Mac. Thanks, everyone. Um, and there's so much more. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a call to action um, section of the book. There's also so much data that you could find um, in the book, um, including county profiles. So if you're wondering uh, where your county is faring, uh, please check out that section of um, the book. Um, there's also more data available by um, race in the data dashboard and our Kentucky Kids Count um, Data Center. Um, and then there's also information on our race equity page of our website as well. And lastly, um, please be on the lookout, as Terry mentioned, uh, for our Blueprint for Kentucky's Children um, policy agenda that we'll be releasing on December 8th. And there's so many of those policy priorities that are driven by this data that you see today. Um, so now that we're going to transition to our conversation with our legislators, um, I just wanted to take a second to say thank you to our sponsors um, for our book this year, Passport Health Plan by, Mo by Molina Healthcare, Cozair Charities, and Charter Communications. So with that, um, we are going to dive into our conversation with um, Representative Heverin and also Representative Cole Carney. So Representative he uh, Heverin, she is a Republican from Litchfield representing District 18, which includes Grayson and part of Hardin County. And then additionally, um, we have Representative Cole Carney. She's a Democrat from Louisville representing um, District 40, which is part of Jefferson County. So good morning and welcome to you both and thanks for joining. Um, I just wanted to take a second to say, you know, we at Kentucky Youth Advocates believe um, what gets measured gets changed. Um, and so what is your reaction to the data that we just shared with you all? Either one could go first. Okay, I don't care to kick us off. Uh, first off, thank you all so much for having uh, Representative Kokarni and I. I think I can speak for both of us and say we're very excited to be here today um, and just be able to have be part of this conversation. You know, I wanna say that I, I was surprised by the data, but I'm really not, you know, each and every day I'm in my community um, and I see it firsthand. 
uh, I, I will say some of the data is very disappointing, um, you know, and but that's why I'm here. I'm here to, to here to make numbers better uh, for Grayson County and, and part of Hardin County too. Um, you know, I think during the pandemic, uh, I started spending a lot of time at our uh, food pantry in Grayson County, the Grayson County Alliance. And you really learn a lot from volunteering your time in places like that because you see the people uh, that's your neighbors, the people you went to school with, uh, and some of the just the hard times that they're facing. Um, and being able to love on people, I think, is, is the best part of my job. And being able to help um, by being kind and being helpful uh, whenever we need help in our community, uh, but also being able to bring legislative solutions. Um, you know, in Grayson County, uh, it, it says that our... Um, you know, our children in poverty is almost 30%, which is very similar to Appalachia. Um, and that's a conversation point that's been talked about since I was elected in 2019 quite a bit, um, because we've got a lot to do uh, for, po for poverty and access to opportunity. Um, and that's a, a really big reason why I'm so honored to be the co-chair of the Commission on Race and Access to Opportunity, to really have a seat at the table to be able to make change in that. And, and I'll jump in. Um, thanks for having us. Happy birthday, Mahek. Um, and thank you all for all the good work that you do in advocating for Kentucky's youth. Um, I want to echo everything Rep. Heverin said and, and thank her for really championing this commission that studies race and access to opportunity in Kentucky and for inviting me to be part of that commission. Already, it's been um, eye-opening in terms of the information that we've heard. And, and one of the things that I, you know, to your question, in terms of data, right? So I, I am an attorney, which doesn't necessarily mean that I'm a researcher or anything, but I know what I don't know. Um, and I know that data and information and experts who are in these fields um, are vital resources for anybody making policy. And you look at this, this data that you've presented and the pillars that you're talking about, education, health, family and community, economic security, and really what that is, is a blueprint for legislators to look at and say, not just this one data point, but look at everything holistically. We have to look at every single piece of information that you've presented and compiled and, and create policies that address all of it. You know, we talk about cradle to career, but what's obvious and what's clear from everything that we've t discussed today and what's presented in the data is that really we have to be looking at it from pre-birth, right? So we're looking at prenatal, postnatal, on through into adulthood, and we, we have to create ways to make the inputs that we provide for our children equal um, and fair and equitable and enough adequate inputs um, so that everybody has an opportunity to thrive. And so I think that the big takeaway for me and I hope for any legislator is, is the holistic approach, the comprehensive approach that we need to be taking um, if we're really gonna move the needle forward in terms of our kids' health um, and their success. I think that's a great segue into our next question that I want to talk about is really policy solutions. You know, that's that's really our bread and butter. That's what we do at Kentucky Youth Advocates. We're here as lobbyists for kids. And um, so what policy change um, solutions that were mentioned in the book animate you? Nima, you want to start on that one first? Sure, sure. sure. Um, so there's several pieces of legislation that I've looked at that are echoed in some of the, the legislative, um, I guess, in incentives and encouragements that are that are presented. And that includes really sort of specific things like highlighting the disparity between home ownership and renters um, and, and how the pandemic has really thrown that into stark relief. Um, and how really tenuous a person's position is in their own home. And so if you're a child and you're not sure whether or not you're going to have a roof over your head, what is that impact? Food insecurity, things like that. Um, so I'm working on two bills specific to evictions and making evictions a little bit more fair um, statewide. And so, you know, I think Rep. Heverin mentioned and you have you know, highlighted in terms of your data that this is not just an urban issue or a rural issue, that these these are issues that are impacting everybody in Kentucky. If you don't know where you're going to lay your head at night, it's going to have an impact on you and it's going to have an impact on your kids and your family. Um, and so that's 
one issue is just housing insecurity. Um, making sure that rates of incarceration and sentencing in our youth, the disparities are addressed. So there's several uh, bills that have been introduced. I know in my three years in, um, as a legislator and judiciary, um, and we tend to look at those in terms of what is this particular bill? What is this particular language? But again, I think we need to look at the really comprehensive impact that sentencing reduction might have in the life of a young person and their ability to then become a rehabilitated, uh, constructive, contributing member of society and not just punishment oriented, but really how do we help this person reintegrate into society? Um, and so criminal justice issues, um, housing issues, um, environmental issues, so the climate, issues that we're going to be facing that we're already facing um, globally nationwide and here in kentucky aren't going to go away and they're going to just make all of these data points that you've created that you've talked about and the disparities that are prevalent in them even worse and so if we're not talking about and the pandemic again is one of these sort of um, macro backdrops that have highlighted the disparities and that's going to be the same for um, any kind of climate issue. So PFAS regulation is another bill that I'm working on. And these are really specific. So they're not necessarily legislative priorities that were identified from you, um, but they are in the same direction um, and in the same token that, that we need to be addressing these against the backdrop of some of the larger issues that are gonna be um, widening those gaps and those disparities. So what I'm hearing is you're not gonna be busy at all this upcoming session. <laughs> going on vacation <laughs> yeah um no we that like you mentioned um some of those issues are issues that we have been discussing like parental incarceration we know that that has impacted many families in kentucky and certainly something that we're looking at and hoping that you as legislators can lift up as we continue to um think about shared what we call is shared sentencing um because when a parent is incarcerated we know that child also feels that effect um, so that's great to hear. And we would love to hear more about that housing piece that you're um, going to be working on in the upcoming session. Representative Heverin, do you want to um, chime in? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the big thing is um, I, I love that you all are really talking about data. And obviously, this book provides data, but we really need some we need some language and statute that requires data. You know, last session I introduced House Bill 212, uh, which required um, for the Maternal Mortality Commission or the Maternal Mortality Board um, to also get race, income, and geography whenever they had maternal mortalities. And, you know, some easy things like that, just to add in a few words to legislation that's going to require that data to come up. Now, I've been working with the cabinet because they said, oh, well, we can't get income. You know, that's impossible to get. And I was like, well, if we could just get Medicaid versus non-Medicaid, I think that would be a good indicator because is it lack of access to opportunity? Is it, you know, I mean, what, what are these things? And so um, the, the cabinet's going to start working on that, but adding pieces like that, and I think that's been an overarching theme of the commission, you know, in our, our November meeting is next week, and it's our kind of our wrap up, and we're going to be talking about what type of legislation we want to see come from that, and I really think a lot of it's going to be data. It's going to be data on education. That includes race, and it's going to be data on uh, health care. It could be data on, um, um, gosh, criminal justice. But I think that's something that's really important. And that's something I always try to, to focus on. You know, we've got to be able to have data before we can create good policy. And some that sometimes that includes putting that in statute of collecting that data. And something, you know, we're kind of really, we're, we're at the beginning stages of the commission, let's be honest. And so we're still looking for staff. So that's something that we're going to have to come up with. But what I really want to do is do a comprehensive research of, what has Kentucky done already for, for race and for access to opportunity? What legislation's there? Because if you're familiar with the legislative process, just because we pass as legislators doesn't mean the executive branch always carries it out. And that isn't a slight towards our current administration. That's for Republicans and Democrats. There's just kind of a disconnect sometimes. And so making sure that the legislation we have in place and the laws are actually being carried out. And so I think you'll see that's a big conversation piece. Um, and that's, you know, I, I saw a quote a few weeks ago on Instagram, and it said um, that comfort is a slow death. And that's really something I try to remember as we look at policy solutions. 
because we can get so comfortable in our positions, but unless you're willing to have hard conversations, nothing's going to change. And so something I'm working on this session, uh, this upcoming session is going to be childcare. You know, how can we help parents? How can we help children? Um, with that, another conversation is paid family leave, which Representative Kulkarni and I, listen, Representative Kulkarni is one of my best friends in the legislature. <laughs> um, uh, I really, I re really appreciate uh, our camaraderie and just being able to have conversations. And I think sometimes bipartisanship means saying, hey, we're not always going to agree on everything, but what can we agree on? And even if we don't agree, let's listen to each other and hear each other's perspectives. And I really encourage all of you all to have that type of relationship with friends, uh, especially being in the legislature. I think that's an important aspect because we can really learn from each other. Um, and so, you know, I, had, I started a task force yesterday, uh, a working group on paid family leave. And we've got Republicans and Democrats and, um, you know, people from all over the spectrum, even policy wise, and saying, hey, let's lead on this in Kentucky. What can we do that's going to pass both of our caucuses? Um, both Republicans and Democrats. And so, yeah, so it's going to be a very interesting next two years. Uh, <laughs> lots going on. Uh, but I, I do think um, there's a lot that can be done. But I think a big point for me is just making sure that we've got the data and statute that we're actually seeing from Kentucky government, our programs that we already have, uh, and what we can do to change that. That's always a great starting point. Um, you're kind of like an honorary, we, you both are kind of an honorary KYA or because that's our mindset um, and how we look at things. So that's helpful and, and great to hear. So I, I know you guys both mentioned um, the commission that you both are a part of. I know uh, Representative Heverin, you co-chair that commission. Um, so wanted to kind of dive in and, and ask you, what are some reasonable expectations for addressing racial disparities um, based on that commission? And um, I know you mentioned data as one, but are there others, goals or um, really challenges that you, you're trying to address? You know, I'm going to be honest, and I think our biggest challenge right now is getting everyone at the table. Um, you know, we've still got members of the commission who don't attend all of our meetings, and that's a hurdle because unless we're able to have everyone there, all um, 11 members, we're really not going to be able to have strong policy conversations. And so that's that's our biggest hurdle right now is getting everyone there and being part of the conversation. Um, you know, the first, it is, it only meets certain interim, so I think we've had four meetings. Uh, since it started, and we've just brought in all types of different groups. Uh, I think that this this interim has helped us start preparing for next interim of having conversations. You know, something that Representative Kulkarni and I have talked about is we need to have a meeting specifically based on access to opportunity, and and that doesn't necessarily have to mean race, but it also can mean you know where, where's the lack of access, and that's a really good conversation starter for the rural urban divide. Um, now, I do want to say whenever we pass this legislation um, for the, the commission last session, you know, I said this isn't a, a rural urban divide. This is a Kentucky problem. Uh, it affects everyone, uh, you know, from Pikeville to Paducah um, and northern Kentucky to, to southeastern Kentucky. This is an issue we all should be focused on. Um, but I think that the big thing with the something we keep just going back to is data. We need data to be able to make changes on this commission. And I think that you're going to see a lot of that. Um, hopefully next week, uh, if, you know, if we'd had this meeting, you know, next week, I probably could tell you more because we really want to have our members input um, on what we can do, what, what they feel like would be helpful um, for us to pass legislation. You know, Senator Givens and I were both the co-chair of the commission. You know, it's not just us to decide what we think would be helpful as our entire commission of what we want to move forward. And honestly, we had a conversation earlier this week. We want to be cheerleaders for our members. You know, if they want to introduce legislation, what can we do to help? What can we do to talk to members? Um, and so I think, but I think, the, you know, the data point is the biggest thing. And then just getting member participation is the next. And I can't um, overstate the importance of what Rep. Heaven mentioned about data. We can't move forward on anything. We can't create policy. We can't even begin to have any set goals or objectives without knowing what the disparities are. Um, and so her work in, in moving task forces through the, through the uh, legislature and creating these commissions is vital. Um, and, and her point about mandating that data be 
um, collected and gathered and compiled on these disparities is crucial. It's, it's the only way that we're going to be able to actually know um, what we're looking at, what is the scope of this issue, whether you're talking about education, whether you're talking about um, health, and each of those issues, by the way, you could spend a lifetime, right, just on one of those issues, um, trying to move those policies forward and trying to move those outcomes forward. Um, but we can't do any of that without data, without actually knowing what the problem is, knowing what the scope is, figuring out what the gaps are, and then really working together. Again, I can't uh, commend uh, Rep. Hevern enough because she's approaching this as, as I do in terms of we're not going to be experts in everything. We shouldn't approach legislation as I'm the smartest one in the room without knowing anything about the issue that you're, you know, either presenting legislation on or voting on. And that's that's the real the real issue is I, I'm not going to vote on a piece of legislation unless I know what the impact is and if there's unintended impact or if it's actually going to do what it says it's going to do. Um, and so, again, I think it's really crucial in anything that we do to to have something in there that requires data gathering and collection and, and compilation so that we know in any given session moving forward, have we done anything to help or have we been moving backwards? Um, so I think that that I agree with Rep. Hebron that that is the first step um, to any good policy. And I just to add on to that too, you know, I think a lot of times people in uh, positions of authority or power, you know, whether you're a public servant or you're appointed or whatnot, you have a lot of assumptions and just because you assume something is happening doesn't mean that's the case and you know data makes people uncomfortable and you know i'm always kind of the person of like well what if we find out that we're not doing something right we can make it better or what if we find out that we're actually doing a really good job and we should put our efforts somewhere else um and one piece of uh one piece of legislation uh, Representative Kulkarni and I failed to mention was Representative Kulkarni has been spearheading uh, the domestic violence bill with unemployment. And, you know, I mean, that affects children just as much as the, the parent that is suffering the abuse. And, you know, Representative Kulkarni brought me on on that, and I'm so thankful for that. But, you know, it's a great conversation starter, and I really hope that we're able to see it move this session but it really, it's a bill that makes you empathize and makes you realize like, hey, this hasn't happened to me. Hope You know, to, that, that has not happened to me personally, but it's a conversation we need to talk about because things are happening that we that just haven't affected us yet maybe, or maybe it's affected one of our family members and it's a way for them to get out or a constituent. And, you know, I just really uh, commend Representative Gokarni for that, uh, for seeing that being an injustice and, and trying to make it, make it better because whenever we're able to get out of cycles like that it only makes our world better uh, and it makes it better for the person that's enduring it and for the family members that are also having to see it or, or be in it as well. We thank you both for carrying that piece of legislation and we look forward to partnering with you all on that and seeing how we could get it to the finish line um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, are there any other pieces of policy that you, looking ahead to Frank, uh, Frankfurt in legislative session um, in come January, are there any other pieces of policy that um, us as child advocates need to be aware of or you need our support on? I think um, I'll just, I think we're at Pevrin's work in childcare and, and uh, family leave are going to be definitely important to look at. I, I thank her for signing on to the UI, um, extending UI benefits to domestic violence victims. Um, and I, I think that her comments about breaking cycles, I think any legislation where that's the objective, breaking whatever the cycle is, whether it's economic disparities, racial inequities, um, health disparities, I think those those are the, the pieces of legislation that need to be looked at. But her, she's been working hard on um, legislation that I think uh, certainly KYA can get behind and should support. Thank you. Um, yeah, the child care is the big, I think that's a really big one. Um, one bill, and I think, you know, Layla has been part of the conversations, uh, she's on here from KSAP, um, has been a bill over rape. Um, you know, that's a, basically it, it kind of came up in Minnesota, there is a Supreme Court ruling 
uh, where a woman had been raped and it got thrown out. Um, well, it got overturned. It didn't get thrown out. It got overturned uh, because she had been intoxicated. She had drank. Um, and so, you know, to me, I was like, I saw that. It was one of the last days of session uh, earlier this year. And I was like, oh, my God, like, what if that happens in Kentucky? Like, if someone has drank and gets raped, like, that's not their, you know, like, that shouldn't be part of the evidence um, to overturn it. Um, I don't know. I just, that's something that's very important to me. And so that's been a big conversation, um, you know, that we've been having um, here. And so just looking at Kentucky laws and saying, hey, how can we kind of make sure this doesn't ever happen here? Uh, which that was a, a clearly pro Minnesota law. But you see those things. And I think it's really important to be proactive in legislation because a lot of times we tend to be reactive. Something's happened and now we've got to make the change. Um, and I'm trying to think what else I've been working on. Uh, but I think probably for you all, the child care portion is the most important. Um, and, you know, we'll kind of see where that goes and uh, paid family leave, which probably will be more of 2023. Uh, but it'll be an ongoing conversation throughout next year. Rep. Hevering, can you um, kind of dive into more of the child care um, piece that you're looking into? We have several child care yeah. um, partners here that are joining us today. So I'm sure this has piqued their interest. Yes, uh, I'm going to be quick. I've got to run to Judiciary Committee in just a minute. Um, but so basically, it's, it's an open ended conversation. Uh, something that we are kind of toying with is the thought of what can we do, um, you know, because transportation is a huge issue and second and third shift trying to find child care for that's a big issue. And so are there ways that we could have industrial uh, parks create a child care facility at that location? Something we're also looking at, which that includes planning and zoning, and that includes a lot of people. Um, but that's, you know, that's one thought. Another thought is creating a fund uh, for an employer match uh, that would help uh, having it, having child care as a benefit. You know, women have well, left the workforce so quickly during COVID. And, you know, I think we've, we've been taken back probably 10 to 20 years um, of the strides that women have made. And so looking at that, and, um, you know, how can we start looking at this as a benefit uh, with like a, you know, where the employer could put in money and match with the employee or seeing if there could be some type of fund uh, with the state. Um, so looking at that, also just looking at removing burdensome regulations for child care owners. Uh, I know that uh, I've been working with a child care owner in uh Bardstown and you know he was saying like the CCAP funding you know it's great until 2023 and then what are you all going to do after 2023 and so also looking at that to see if that would be something that we could increase uh, just to help the offset of expenses so lots of different ways we'll see what the legislation ends up being uh, but you know uh, feel free to share my email um, and if anyone on here would have any you know comments or uh, suggestions I'm very open to listening to that to see what we can do to help uh, child care facilities over the uh, across the Commonwealth and I hate to run but thank you all so so much for having me I greatly appreciate it. I've got to go to judiciary and see what we can do on criminal justice reform now um, so thank you and I think representative Paul Carney is also on judiciary yeah um, so <laughs> thank you all so much and I'll see you all soon thank you thank representative you. Paul Carney I don't know if you have any final words before you have to run as well um, I, I think that, so I will echo Rep. Heverin's comment. So the majority, the vast majority of any legislation I introduced is brought to me by advocates or constituents, uh, primarily constituents, because I'm directly addressing issues that they've come to me with. Um, I rarely just sort of make up legislation or pick an issue um, that I don't directly have somebody asking me um, to help them with. So I think that is crucial for advocates to do um, is to reach out to legislators, whether there's a personal interest, whether there's just a good relationship um, or whether this is something they do right. If you're an attorney or if you're interested in criminal justice or if you're a judge or, you know, whatever occupational um, relevance there is. But I think advocates have a really outsized role in making sure that legislators are aware of the potential of legislation and the possibilities that exist because we again may not know that it's possible to approach some of these larger issues in a very specific way in terms of policy um, and so i think that's really important for us to know don't assume that we will just sort of get there um, you know i think it's really important to have these conversations and be um, very proactive uh, both legislators in terms of listening and advocates in terms of uh, reaching out 
And, and with that, I have to run. I'm sorry, y'all, but thanks for having me. We appreciate you both, both joining us today. Um, we certainly can see that um, working together across the aisle, sharing knowledge and resources are going to really close the gaps for Kentucky kids. So we appreciate you both. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. And I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Melissa Collins. Thanks, Mahek. And thank you to, pan to our panelists today, Representative Heverin and Representative Cole Carney for joining us today. We also want to thank Aetna Better Health of Kentucky for their support of today's Advocate Virtual Forum. And as I kind of want to echo what Jesse mentioned earlier um, at the start of this forum is that while today and every day we want to celebrate Kentucky kids, we also have to take a hard look at the work that still needs to be done. And as the data shows from today's forum, that it's a, the hard reality is that race plays a major role in the outcomes of youth. But the good news is that together we can advance racial equity for Kentucky kids. So I would just remind everyone on our forum today of the ways that we can take action by checking out our call to action section of the book, our county profiles, interactive da data dashboard, and uh, visiting our kyyouth.org um, on our website. And looking ahead to upcoming forums, our next forum will be Wednesday, December 8th, when we will launch the 2022 Blueprint for Kentucky Children's State Policy and Budget Priorities. The policies address health, child welfare, education, families, economic security, and much more. So in addition to sharing more information about the policies, we will also hear from our legislators. So as always, the follow-up email will include a recording of today's forum, slides, links we discussed, and the RSVP form to our next forum. So thanks again for joining us, and we hope you will have a great rest of your day.